You know, this week, our country experienced a, a very deep and dramatic tragedy where a young man went into a school and, and decided to harm and kill many. You know, there are all kinds of people out there, if you watch the news or whatever, that are trying to explain it and trying to point the blame here and there and everywhere and trying to come up with a word that would help them comprehend it or whatever. And, and I'll tell you that I really think there is just one word that describes what we saw this week. And that one word is evil. That it's evil that we saw this week. And you know, here's the sad part, I suppose, and maybe I shouldn't admit this to you, but I feel compelled to do so, to tell you that I'm not even surprised anymore when we turn on the news and we see things like this. Now, it doesn't mean I'm not sickened by it, but I'm not surprised either. It just seems like every time we turn around, there is a new form of evil that is rearing its ugly head. That there is a new tragedy out there, that there are constantly plagues, rumors of war and war, Trials of various kinds, persecutions, earthquakes, whatever. And by the way, all of that comes right out of Matthew chapter 24. Talking about what life will be like as we come nearer to the end of time. And so those things don't surprise me. I think we should expect for evil to come. We don't like to talk about that stuff, but I mean, part of why we're here is to be equipped to deal with those things. We should expect evil to come. The Bible's clear that we should expect it. We should expect evil to come, especially against those who are innocent. And we should expect it because the devil is very real. And he hates God. But the devil also knows that he is not powerful enough to defeat God. And just like in so many of the movies that we love, you know, there's a hero of the story and the villain isn't powerful enough or not capable of destroying the hero. And so what does the villain do? The villain goes after the ones that the hero loves. Goes after his kids so often. And the reason I think those stories make sense to us, the reason why those stories speak to us is because it's our story. We live in this story where the devil knows he can't destroy God. So he goes after those who are made in his image, his sons and daughters. And he goes after them to destroy them, to harm God, to harm us, to cause harm. And what we saw this week, that's not the only kind of attack, by the way. I mean, even this week, if we just looked at this week, not on a global scale, because if we look at the attacks on a global scale, this would be a totally different picture. But just even here among the life that we live in this country, one of the other interesting attacks happened with uh, an ABC uh, TV anchor who had something to say about uh, Vice President Pence's faith. And her remark about him was that it was mental illness. Here's what's interesting. If she had said that about any other religion, she would have absolutely been obliterated. But Christianity, it seems, is just open season all the time. For people to discredit and destroy with their words if they can. And so we deal with these attacks, and again, it shouldn't really surprise us. Because when we start to look at Scripture, here are the things that we see. Like in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1-5, through 5, it says, But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. Let me just ask, has anyone in the room ever experienced difficulty in this life? I'd guess that if you're paying attention, everybody would say yes. No matter how old we are or where we've come from, every one of us have dealt with difficulty. But then it goes on to describe it in verse 2. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, my favorite, disobedient to their parents. In first service, someone over here on the side went, that'll preach. (laughs) Truly. Ungrateful. Unholy. Heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, like 
joy be heart. Without self-control. Brutal. Not loving good. Treacherous. Reckless. Swollen with conceit. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having the appearance of godliness but denying his power. Avoid such people. You know, when you look at a passage like that, I suspect you would agree that that sounds about right. It sounds about right for the world that we live in, the life that we um, live, the life that we deal with these kinds of things. This sounds about right. The truth is, nothing new is under the sun. These things have always been. But they ramp up and they grow and we see these things more and more every day. And you know, it seems like the we battle flesh and blood. But ultimately we don't. We don't actually battle against flesh and blood, even though it feels like it all the time. Instead, what we battle against are rulers and powers and principalities, cosmic powers, evil, darkness that wants to destroy and overcome the light. And this is what Paul addresses to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 6. And so I want to read for you uh, verses 10 through 20 in Ephesians 6. If you've got your Bible, would love for you to follow along with me. But here's what Ephesians 6, 10 through 20 says to us from Paul. And he says, finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, church, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, in all circumstances take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert, church, with all perseverance, church, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me, that words may be given to me in the opening of my mouth, boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Even now we do this. Paul is writing a letter to the church in Ephesus. And he is finally, he is concluding the entire message. And part of his conclusion involves something that they really desperately need to hear. That they need to hear about the world that they live in. And so he is addressing the church, the family of God. In a sense, he's addressing the army of God. You pick up that kind of language here in this text. That he's addressing the army of God and specifically... He is petitioning believers. He is petitioning the soldiers of Christ who are fighting a very real battle that's going on. And so he's addressing it here and he's addressing it from prison. He even says that I'm in chains. Paul is writing this letter from a prison cell. Most likely he's actually chained to a Roman soldier. And this Roman soldier would be dressed like Roman soldiers are dressed in armor. And Paul is chained down to this guy. And I can only imagine that God opens his eyes to look around and see that there is a different battle than what he sees that there's a very real spiritual battle that's going on around him that there is opposition and an oppressive force that the true battle that's actually happening is a spiritual one and then God opens his eyes to a metaphor as he's attached to this Roman soldier a metaphor for the armor that we as the church that we as Christians must have to protect ourselves from the schemes of the devil. And so Paul 
explains what we need to be equipped to deal with the battle. What we need in order to handle and to stand against the spiritual warfare that is all around us all the time. And this is important because I will tell you, I think every true Christian has experienced spiritual warfare in their lives in some manner, whether they even realize it or not, where God is blessing, Satan is surely to attack. And Satan strives to take Christians out. He wants to take Christians out and destroy the work of God, to obstruct it. And then I will tell you, in my experience, what you see are the people that are working the hardest to be effective as a Christian, to be effective out there in sharing the gospel, the good news. Those who are the most effective are the ones that seem to take the brunt of the battle. The devil comes after them consistently and constantly when we walk worthy of the calling we've received. When we decide to be a sold out believer and do it God's way. When we decide to live and walk in humility instead of pride. In unity instead of division. In the new self that God offers instead of the old me. Instead of the old self, when we walk in love instead of lust or light as opposed to darkness. When we decide to walk in wisdom rather than foolishness. Or mutual submission to one another. Instead of that rugged, self-serving independence, I'm in charge. I will do what I want, no one can tell me. When we decide to walk and live in community as opposed to isolation. We can be sure the devil will oppose us. We can just be sure of it. That he will oppose us at every turn. And I will tell you the same goes for brand new believers. You know, God has given me the opportunity to be in the middle of so many stories of people's faith journey. And I will tell you, it's ultimately my favorite thing in life to do. I love to equip and to grow and to challenge but I also love to see someone come who isn't sure who isn't sure about who Christ is but by the time we're done they know who he is and they want to follow but I also love to have the opportunity and God's given me hundreds and hundreds of them to baptize new believers into Christ, to be washed clean, to start new, to take on the new self instead of the old, all of those things. And that's not bragging, it's just a celebration that God's allowed me to be a part of hundreds of them. And, but almost every time I am sure to tell that person, just be prepared, the next week may be hell. And that's not to be quippy or weird, it is to say that the devil doesn't like to give up easy. And that when people make that commitment to follow Christ, especially new believers that want to go out and tell the world, look at what just happened. New believers are always the most effective to go out and share their story. And when that happens, sometimes the devil loves to go, oh no, you do not do that. And loves to distract or loves to create doubt in people's hearts that anything has changed. And he comes after people who are living that life to follow Christ. And here's the thing. The devil doesn't have to waste his ammo on people he's already got. And he doesn't have to waste his ammo on people that are not dangerous to the kingdom of darkness. The target are the people who submit to God and resist the devil. That's James 4, 7. We talked about it last week. If you missed last week, you should go back and listen. Because that call to the church, that call to believers is to submit, yes, surrender to God and resist the devil and he'll flee. Those are the ones who get the target on their back. Those are the ones that Satan wants to go after. And I will tell you, even those of us that are rebelling constantly against the darkness, we still don't have power to do it in our flesh. We don't have enough strength in our flesh. We don't have enough strength in our humanity, in our humanness to fight that battle on our own. We don't. The devil is a supernatural being and although he is not all powerful, that's God who is all powerful. Now the devil will lie and try to tell you that he is all powerful. He is not. But even though he is not all powerful, he is still ruthless and he does not fight fair 
and he likes to cause all sorts of trouble. And so Paul tells us in Ephesians 6 that we need to be prepared for this very real battle. That we need to be prepared for the spiritual battle. That we need to be able to be ready and be strong and find our strength in his strength. Because ultimately we are weak. Although 2 Corinthians 12.10 tells us that when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Because in my weakness, God can make it beautiful. This is why we see throughout the New Testament, God picks ordinary, average, normal people to proclaim his goodness. Because no one would look at that person and go, well, they're amazing, so it's not the power of God, it's them. No, he picks normal people to go out and share the gospel message, the good news, so that people will know that there is a God in heaven at work. And so Paul tells us to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Now the challenge is, though, I think we sometimes think we still are strong enough to fight the battle on our own. Part of that's because most people don't realize there's actually a spiritual battle, or they don't believe that it's true, and so we fight off all the challenges in our own flesh or whatever. But I gotta tell you, we must be careful not to look in the wrong place for our strength. And if, especially guys, I think, we cha we're challenged. We think we're strong, we're able to do it, but no, we're not strong enough in our flesh. We are not strong enough... To fight the battle if we have good resources. Resources don't do it. Abilities don't do it. Our strength is not found in those. Our strength is not found in how much money we've got in the bank. Our strength is not found in how long we've been a Christian or how many Bible verses we've memorized. There are plenty of atheists out there that know the Bible back and backwards and forwards. But they don't believe that it's true. They don't want to follow it. They don't want to have someone to answer to. Just knowing words doesn't do it. But understanding the power that is within. That's where our strength comes from. Our strength doesn't come from how many degrees we have. Or what seminary someone went to. Our strength doesn't come from how big our church is. That is not the strength. Our strength individually and collectively as the church is our union with Christ. It is our unity within this community surrounded around the cross. That is where ultimately our strength comes from. And we've got to know it. That our strength is from Jesus. Because with this strength, we can resist the devil. With this strength, we can mount a defense. Paul talks about that in verse 13. Where we are called to mount a defense. To stand our ground. And with his strength, we can walk in the Lord's strength. But we must do so with the tools that God has given us to fight with and to defend ourselves, to stand our ground. We must use the tools. And so in verse 11, Paul goes on to talk about this divine armor that we need. We need a divine armor, a supernatural armor to fight the supernatural battles that rage around us. And so what Paul is doing is he is commissioning, he is instructing. In a sense, he is begging the church to put on the whole armor of God. To put on the whole armor so that we can stand against the schemes of the devil. And when we say whole armor, it means the whole armor. That means we don't pick and choose like I want this little piece of armor and this little piece of armor. Uh, choosing a couple things to, that we like, that does, not, that does not make us bulletproof. That does not make us fireproof. If we pick and choose what kind of supernatural armor, spiritual armor we want. It is necessary to be completely armored. With the armor that God has given us. Otherwise, we have weak spots. We have chinks in the armor. And although the devil doesn't know everything, he is a good student of human behavior. And he will come after those weak spots. He will come after them. And if we're not careful, those vulnerable spots will create opportunity for us to be taken out by the devil and his demonic forces. By the way, to fight the enemy well... To fight him, it helps to know who he is. Because I don't think people think about it. I think it's one of the great ruses of the devil is that he makes people believe he's not even real. But the Bible talks about it, and Paul already mentioned him a couple of chapters before this in chapter 4 verse 27. Paul is addressing, you can be angry but don't sin. And part of that is if we sin in our anger, we're giving an opportunity to the devil for him to mess in there. If we're sinning out of our anger... 
that it gives the devil a foothold. And so when we look at that word for the devil, that it's out of Greek, the original language Paul used, it's diabolos. That's what it means. But here's what that word actually means. It means slanderer. This is what the devil's good at, is to slander God, to slander his name, to slander Christians. And that's what we saw with Joy Bihar at ABC. It was this. It shouldn't even surprise us to take on that kind of slander. Why? Because that's the definition of who the devil is. He is the slanderer. He opposes. He accuses. He is the adversary. And that's actually what Satan means in Hebrew, is an adversary. And there are all kinds of titles throughout Scripture. He's the devil. He's the head of the demons and his minions. The serpent, Beelzebul, the god of this age, the evil one, the dragon. And these names tell us a couple of things. He is powerful. Not all powerful. Not more powerful than God. But he is powerful. He is cunning. He is wicked. He is absolutely evil. And we need God's armor. Because we are facing one who opposes God which means he opposes us who follow after God. He opposes us in everything we stand for because everything about him is evil. But Satan is also strategic. And I want you to see from this text, that's part of what Paul is talking about in verse 11. He talks about the schemes of the devil. What he really is saying is that the devil has tactics. The devil, the devil has schemes to destroy and to lead people astray. The question would be like what? Because we need to be prepared. If we know who he is, then we should know how he attacks. Well, we can look through scripture and we see examples like when Jesus is taken into the wilderness. Forty days he fasts and he comes under the temptation. Now Jesus does not fail. Jesus does not sin. He is able to withstand the pressure, the temptation of the devil. But how does the devil attack him? He has three attacks the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And I will tell you, when we see that example, it tells us this is the playbook of the devil. We know who he is, and we know what strategies he uses. And he loves to come after us with things of the lust of the flesh. I see it, and I want it so bad. Or the lust of the eyes, that same kind of concept where we have to consume, and we want all these things. Or the pride of life. I am the king I am in charge because ultimately really what he wants to say to you is you're God, you're God, you can do what you want. No one to answer to, it's one of the greatest tricks of all time to convince people that that's the truth. And so he comes after Jesus that way, but there's other things we know like discouragement. Discouragement's a big tactic the devil uses against us. When we look at our life and look at ministry or whatever and we become discouraged. It's easy to become discouraged. Or how about doubt? By the way, we need to make sure we understand what doubt is because I think we live in a world full of doubt. Doubt happens, especially with Christians, when they set incorrect expectations for who God is or how God acts. And then when God doesn't live up to their expectations, it creates doubt. What happens is out of ignorance, we don't know who God is. We don't know how he works. And so in reality, what we're really doing is saying, I believe in a God that would do this. And here's what that actually means. If I were God, this is how it would be. The devil's already lied to us to say, you're God, you can do whatever you want to. And so then when we don't have God living up to our expectations of how we would do it, it creates doubt for us. And I would tell you, I think most of the doubt that Christians have these days is because they don't know God well enough to know who he is and to know the expectations he sets. And when he doesn't live up to our make-believe and pretend expectations, it creates doubt. I think other tactics are just frustration. We get frustrated with people. I don't, just out of curiosity, anyone in the room ever gotten frustrated with another Christian person? Anybody want to raise both hands? People are annoying sometimes. Can I say that? I just did. People are annoying sometimes. And people frustrate us. And we let that get out of control. And it becomes a tactic that the devil uses to divide 
but also uses confusion, yes, division, moral failure, doctrinal error, or we don't know what the Bible says. Hate is a great tactic of the devil to make us hate one another. How about ridicule? Like what we saw with Mike Pence this week, ridicule. The devil uses that kind of stuff. And of course, Christians do that with, against each other and ridicule about various things that at the end of the day don't mean much. Or how about Genesis 1.1? Genesis 1.1, the very beginning of the Bible, the first line, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I think one of the tactics of the devil is to try to obliterate that one statement so you don't read the rest. Now, my background, if you don't know my background, I started as a science guy and was an agnostic. And as I studied science, that's actually how I came to faith. As I studied genetics, there was, it was clear to me that there was a creator in all of it. And that's what led me on my own faith journey. But as I looked and saw what the Bible had to say, it was very clear that one of the tactics of the devil is that if he can discredit the first line of the book, why read the rest? And oh, has he been effective. Oh, has he been effective. And by the way, it is not intellectually dishonest to believe in God. It's quite the opposite. It is intellectually dishonest to pretend that life began on accident. There is a creator, and every discipline of science proves it over and over again. But that's another message for another day. But I will also tell you one of the tactics of the devil is getting people to believe that he is make-believe or that he's just sort of a cute cartoon character with a red pitchfork and red little horns and we laugh and joke and make costumes out of it and I will tell you that I think that is one of his greatest tactics is to make people, especially Christians, believe he's not real. I shared with you a quote last week. The 60% of the American church don't believe that there's evil. Don't believe that there's a devil. Don't believe in those things. And it is amazing how effective he has been to convince even those who know Jesus that he's not there and not real. But he is. I wish he weren't, but he is. He knows our weakest point, and he aims for it. He comes after us in various ways. And if he can't disable us in one way, he'll try a different way. And he often gets up close and personal in his attacks. In fact, Paul goes on to say in verse 12 that Satan wrestles. We battle, we wrestle. And when you hear that word wrestle, what kind of images come to your mind? Well, for myself, when I think about wrestling, it's about hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's about getting right there in our face, and that's what happens. He gets right down the, in there, hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's not like he's launching laser-guided missiles from a thousand miles away. No, he is right there, right up close, and on our backs sometimes. Now, if you are his, and you, I mean, if you are God's, you belong to Christ, he is trespassing when he tries to jump on you. And you need to take authority over that in the name of Jesus and rebuke him and cast him away. Because he has no access to you if you belong to Jesus. So Paul then says something really interesting in verse 12 though. He says, you know when you wrestle, you're not really wrestling against people. You're not wrestling against flesh and blood. Not that we don't have people coming against us. I think we would all agree that people come against us. The devil uses people to mess with us all the time, opposing us. And Paul knew this better than anyone. Paul was thrown down in pits and hit with stones to try and kill him and left him for dead or beaten with rods. He was shipwrecked and all sorts of things. Paul knew exactly what it was like to deal with evil people. But behind all of these battles, behind all of that evil stuff that people try to do to us, there is another battle, an unseen cosmic and spiritual battle in which we are engaged. And so even though it feels like at times we're wrestling with people and our battle is against people, we're really not battling against 
um, godless philosophers or professors. We're really not battling against Christless cultists or ABC TV hosts. We're really not battling against evil politicians and rulers or even murderous people who seek to do harm. Our battle is ultimately against demonic forces, against battalions of fallen angels, against evil spirits who wield tremendous power. And we're constantly surrounded by it. Though we cannot see them on a day-to-day basis, generally. Although I gotta tell you, uh, so often I hear even Christians say that they're so enamored by ghost hunting and all that and over the years I've had many interactions with people that love that stuff and love to watch the shows and love to go out and and go into the haunted this and that or whatever or whatever to go talk to grandpa who died 20 years ago to get closure or something listen I gotta tell you the truth that's not grandpa talking to you the Bible is super clear that when we die we pass over we're not coming back in those moments What people are chasing after are demons. It's the truth. We should not be chasing after these things or loving these things or watching these things that give you a thrill because it is sneaking in to a dark place the devil wants you in. It is nothing less than playing with the demons that absolutely want you. They desire to oppress and harass and overwhelm. So the question is, should we be afraid? Because as I thought through this, I thought, man, this is so heavy and so intense. Should we be afraid? And the answer is no. You shouldn't be afraid, but that's because God gives us the whole armor to put on to fight these battles, to be able to stand against them. God has equipped us and prepared us to do it. And so when the smoke from the battle clears, we can stand When the evil day comes, which is what Paul talks about, and it feels like all the pressure of the world and on our family and on our churches, when it feels like it's so overwhelming and the flood of pain comes, we don't drown. We don't drown because of the armor of God. And so Paul tells us to suit up. Paul tells us to put it on to protect ourselves, to make ourselves arrow-proof, bulletproof. To make sure that we don't have the weak spots in our armor. And so Paul goes on to talk about seven different pieces of armor. Now, I only have time for one today. You need to come back next week and we'll deal with the, some, some more of them. But this first piece of the armor he talks about is the belt of truth. We see it in verse 14. You see, Satan fights with lies. And sometimes he fights with half-truths. And sometimes those lies sound so right and so good. And an example of that is the very first one we see in the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, Satan comes after Adam and Eve. God has told them, look, you can have anything in the Garden, the fruit of all this except this one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You cannot do that on that day. If you eat it, you'll die. So Satan comes in and he says to Eve... What is it God told you again? You will not surely die. Now here's what's interesting. He's telling a half truth. Because when she ate that fruit, did she kill over dead? No. But there was a spiritual death that was far more encompassing than a physical death. And we've been dealing with the ramifications of that decision ever since. And of course, Adam joined right in there. Adam should have grabbed that snake and broke its neck thrown Eve over his shoulder, and run. But he didn't. He took it too. Why? Because the devil is crafty and he has all kinds of tactics and his lies sound good. He often will lie to us and tell us that the things ultimately that we want in us, he says you can have it even though it drags us down to hell at times with those kinds of things because he is a liar. And so one of his goals is to make believers doubt God to doubt God's goodness his mercy his grace his love his compassion his sufficiency his power Satan loves to get people to not believe those things that he's not all of these he lies because he wants us to blame God when things don't go our way 
And how often do you hear people blame God when things don't go their way? All the time. That's the tactic of the devil to make you blame God when he's really behind it. Isn't that amazing? So when a child dies or is crippled or a husband or a wife is taken away or a child walks away from their faith or we lose a business or we lose our health, Satan and his demons will attempt to get us, especially Christians, to place all the blame on God. Instead of on him, which is really where all the blame needs to go. Ultimately, these attacks attack the truthfulness and the sufficiency of Scripture. Where we get to see what God really thinks. And here's the thing. I, as I thought about it this week, I thought, you know, now you may disagree with me on this. That's okay. But good parents allow their kids to have some challenges in life. A good parent doesn't take every challenge away from their kid. A good parent doesn't take away every painful thing because parents, part of their job is to equip kids to deal with the troubles of life. And that's how we grow up. And God, I think, is the same. In this world, you will have trouble. Jesus tells us that. In this world, you will have trouble. But in that trouble, we learn how to depend on God. Now, there will be a time where there's no more pain. But that's heaven. In the meantime, we live in a world where sin and death exist. And because we live in that world, we have a fight to fight. Now, here's the thing. These aren't the only attacks on God's truth. Think about how common it is to be confused about what the Bible says, about morality, about sexuality, about heaven and hell, salvation, identity. And every other biblical truth. If Christians are confused about the truth. Or if Christians believe they're not smart enough to figure out the Bible. So they never read it. How in the world will Christians defend their faith. Much less obey it. Much less obey it. We run the risk of being tossed here and there by waves. And carried about by every wind of doctrine. That's what Ephesians 4.14 says. But Paul warns Timothy that the spirit explicitly says that in later times. Some will fall away from the faith. Paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. That's 1 Timothy 4.1. Friends that cannot be us. I will tell you I think this is why God has pressed me to do this series. It was not my plan. I had something totally different planned leading up to Easter this year. But it changed last week, and I think it's this passage. The Spirit explicitly says that in later times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. It cannot be us. We must be faithful in holding on to the truth of God's word. But listen, that means... That means it is necessary for the truth to hold us also. To be able to know the truth and live in that truth in our daily lives, to apply it to our daily lives. Because everything has to be tested by his truth. The things that come out of our mouth need to be tested by his truth. The things that we allow in our minds, the things that we think need to be tested by his truth. Because in this we will find strength and protection in the combat. But of course there's a problem and that is... We can't just put on the armor of God when we feel like it or when we think the attack is coming. And I think that's what happens in modern Christianity. We think, well, when the bad things happen, then I'll pay attention. (laughs) Guess what? The armor of God's not like football pads that you strap on before you get ready for a game. No, the darts are always there. They come in waves, I think, at times. But this armor of God that Paul is telling the church to be equipped with, to be able to stand against the evil one, needs to become a part of us that is on us all the time. Like this Roman soldier that Paul is probably tied to or or bound to in chains, he always would have worn a tunic, which was sort of a loose-fitting outer garment that was draped over the body. The problem with that is when they wore the tunic in hand-to-hand combat, it was dangerous because it was easy to grab and be able to destroy someone. And so they would cinch it down tightly with a big leather belt that would hold it together that would gird the loins. And this is what Paul tells us. This is part of the armor that we need to cinch it down. God's truth is absolutely essential for Christians in the battle 
against Satan's schemes. Against the lies that he tells, we need to be girded with the truth, which shows an attitude of readiness, but also genuine commitment. We are like a belt called to be surrounded with his truth. That it holds us at the very core of our body like a belt. His truth needs to encompass us. And so why is this so important? Well, the devil has already been defeated. That's the best news in all of this. The devil's already been defeated and Jesus has already won the victory for us. Paul actually doesn't tell us in this to go out and win the battle. The battle's been won. But what he does tell us is to go stand firm. To go plant our feet and be strong because the final defeat is coming. But just like a defeated enemy who is not in chains already... He is going to continue to fight and he is mad about his defeat and he has not and will not easily surrender. But again, the victory is not in doubt. The victory is decisive. Jesus has won because of the cross, but the devil will still fight until the last day. He will still fight and we are called to fight to stand against him with confidence. Don't be confused though. The enemy's goal is to destroy the church. His goal is to destroy your family. His goal is to destroy your marriage and your witness for Christ. And he'll keep trying, but there is a rock in which this church is built on that the gates of hell will not prevail against. And that's the message from Matthew 16, 18. Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. There is no other. And so what do we do with all of this? Well, to fight the battle well, my friends, the entire church needs to be armed. Not just a few. Not just a few of those prayer warriors. Not just a few of those people that serve in ministry, but the entire church needs to be armed. Because ultimately, even though we find our power and our strength in Christ, there is power in numbers when those numbers are defending and standing with one another, arms linked side by side with the supernatural tools that God has given us to fight with. And this is necessary because sometimes the battle is tiring, yeah? Sometimes it's easy to get weak when we're doing a lot of fighting, but that's why we need each other to hold each other up and strengthen one another as we fight. And if you're weak, someone else next to you is strong and they hold you up, and when you're strong... Or when you're weak and they're strong, they hold us up. And that's how we go through this. It's how we withstand the attacks of the devil. This is why this year, community is our theme. Because together we find unity in Christ. And we come together to fight this battle side by side. 1 Corinthians 16, 8 and 9, Paul says, A wide door for effective work has been opened to me. And there are many adversaries. And I want to tell you, there still are plenty of adversaries out there. And I want to tell you the truth about something else. Ministry is hard. Ministry is hard. I also want to tell you that I think being a devoted follower of Christ is hard at times. And if someone has lied to you and told you that, oh, become a Christian, it's easy skating from that point on. <laughs> it's not. Being a fully devoted follower of Christ is hard at times. And walking with Christ opens us up to the battle that rages. It does. And many pastors are tempted to leave when things get really tough. Many volunteers often bail when times are tough. When people stop showing up to assemble together when times are tough. The attacks of the enemy are tough, but understand this. An easy ministry is probably a weak ministry. Because where the Lord's work is really being done effectively, the devil will surely oppose it. The devil will oppose it and fight. And I think the same is in your families. And so our job is to fight. Our job is to fight it. Bailing is not the right answer. Standing our ground is the right answer. 
Isolation is not the right answer. Community is the right answer as we link arms in strength, not weakness. And living in constant communion with the Lord is the answer. And so let me finish by saying this. Stop flirting with darkness. So many want to straddle the fence with one foot in God's kingdom and one foot in the kingdom of darkness. There is no gray area. Stop flirting with darkness, my friends. Seek the truth. Put on the whole armor of God. And let's fight together. The schemes of the devil. To come together. To commune together. In community. To be strengthened together. And to walk in what Christ has called us to. And so today as we finish up. I want to invite you to communion. I want to invite you to the cross because ultimately this is where the power comes from that defeats the devil's schemes. It was at the cross and the resurrection of Christ as he defeats death that death is defeated, that we find our life. And yes, though our sins are like scarlet, he makes us white as snow. And so this is a time to come to the table and take a piece of that bread which reminds us of the body broken and the cup which reminds us of the blood shed. And as we eat it and drink it, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes because this is the power that we need to fight off the schemes of the devil. To come together and commune with one another. To take this time as a time to repent. If you've been straddling this fence, darkness and light it is time to decide I am not going to walk in this darkness any longer but I am going to walk in the light as he is in the light I am going to step across and follow Christ and repent of this darkness repent of that darkness this is a time for that moment as you come to the cross and it is a time to intercede for one another intercession that type of prayer, an accessory prayer, here's what I think intercession is. I put you on my back when you are too weak, and I will carry you to the foot of the cross. And there are people in here that are so broken and hurting right now that you are battle weary, and you are scarred from the battles and broken hearted, full of doubt and discouragement. And I say to you, Christ can heal you and give you a new life in him. And we will do it together. And so, intercede for one another. Look around the room and see who's broken. God, who do you need me to pray over? And go intercede for them. Carry them to the cross. Help them to find their strength again. To get their legs underneath them again. So we are strong and ready to fight this battle. Because it's real, my friends. Don't let Satan tell you otherwise. And we'll fight it together as the church. And if you need me to intercede, I'll be right here. I'll pray for you. But we've got three songs, and I challenge you, petition you, to put on the whole armor of God, to surrender your life to Christ, to repent and come to the cross, intercede for one another, and let's put on this armor and stand our ground against the evil one. We can do this together and we're called to it. Father, I pray that now as we take this time to reflect and pray, to worship, to commune, that you open our eyes to see your mighty power. Strengthen us for this fight. Give us the tools that we need and give us the community we need to do this together. For those that are lonely and weary, give them strength and hope. For those that are weak from the fight, encourage them 
through your people here. And as we come to the cross, help us to see the victory has been won and that it is time to walk in that victory. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray.